It's in uh, Exodus 34. Exodus 34. I'd like to read for you. The opening verses of that chapter, Moses is back up on Mount Sinai. He had a little bit of an oops moment early in the book of Exodus. He brought down the stone tablets that God had written the Ten Commandments on. And then he heard the party going on. And he looked down and saw the golden calf and Aaron, his brother, leading the party, getting ready to take that golden calf and march back to Egypt and say, look what we found in the desert. See what a great thing it is. We've come back to work as your slaves. <clears throat> so he took those slabs of stone that had the original commandments on it, and he just threw them with all of his strength and smashed them to smithereens in anger. Didn't really solve anything, but it did make an impression on people's minds. God's big plan wasn't finished, and so he had to go back up on the mountain. I want to read for you part of that. He was going back up now to chisel out two new tablets of stone that God's going to write on the Ten Commandments. Starting with verse 8, I think, is where we'll begin. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, he said, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us to your inheritance. Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you before all your people. I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome it is that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command you today, and I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, Perzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you are going, or they will be a snare among you. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Ashtaroth poles. Do not worship any other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous. Jealous. An interesting name for God. We don't often use that one. Is a jealous God. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land, for uh, when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to them, they will inherit you, they will invite you, and you will eat their sacrifices. And when you choose some of their daughters as wives for your sons, and their daughters prostrate themselves to their gods, they will lead your sons to do the same. Do not make cast idols. Celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For seven days eat bread made without yeast, as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time of the month of Abedim. And for that month, you, for that was the month you came out of Egypt. The first offspring of every womb belongs to me, including the firstborn males of your livestock, whether from herd or flock. Redeem the firstborn donkey with a lamb, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem all your firstborn sons. They, you notice he didn't say bring his, break his neck if you don't want to redeem him. You've got to keep your sons, all right? Even if they're frustrating to you. I'm sorry, that was an insight. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Did you read that? Listen to that. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall labor, but on the seventh day you shall rest, even during the plowing season and the harvesting. You must rest. <clears throat> 
celebrate, celebrate the Feast of Weeks with the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the fruits of ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year all your men are to appear before the Sovereign Lord, the God of Israel. I will drive out the nations before you and enlarge your territory, and no one will ever will, and no one will covet your land when you go up three times each year to appear before the Lord your God. Do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast, and do not let any of the sacrifice from the Passover remain until the next morning. <clears throat> Bring the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Do not cook a young goat in a mother's milk. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words. For in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Moses was there with the Lord forty days, forty nights, without eating or drinking, without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant called the Ten Commandments. I'm going to continue just for a second here. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the leaders in the community came back to him and he spoke to them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands of the Lord that had been given to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. And whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face, until he went in to speak with the Lord again. The thought I wanted to share with you, how do you keep the radiance of God? How do you keep the radiance of God? He spoke with God, and a little bit of God reflected back out of his face. And it was powerful enough, it was shocking enough, it was unusual enough, the Israelites were shocked by it and repulsed by it. What's happening? Has Moses turned into some sort of an angel? Is he no longer a human being? Is he now some sort of a deity himself? And so Moses put a veil on his face to close off so they couldn't see the radiance of God. <coughs> and eventually, the radiance of God diminished. It faded. And instead of keeping the veil over his face so that the people wouldn't be frightened, he decided to keep the veil over his face so that they wouldn't see the radiance of God had diminished. I ask you the question, how do you keep the radiance of God? Because that's what we want. We want to be filled with the internal fire of passion to do God's will. And if you listen to what I just read, there were a lot of ways that God suggested and gave for commands on how to stay alive and filled with that passion to be faithful to God. In one sense, what he told Moses was exactly what Jesus told the people in the New Testament. Walking with me, being a part of my family, being a part of my nation, is that pearl of great price. And what does it cost you? What does it cost the people of Israel? You have to stop messing around with these people who don't want the same things you do. I mean, it's simple. 
If you think that you can live in a land with people who go, oh, that's just that stuff you've been talking about out there in the desert for 40 years. You're to, you guys are just obsessed. The fire of God goes out. It's diminished. It's cooled. When you live in a community that worship other gods and they say, oh, it's just one person's preference over another. You made your choice. I made my choice. It's okay. We're both going to the same place. Not exactly. Not according to what God said to Moses. What was his name? The one I pointed out when we stopped and went back over it. What's the name of God? Jealous. My name is Jealous. I don't play games. I don't say one thing one day and another thing the next day. I want all of you. I want to be the thing you hold on to. The thing you get rid of anything else in order so that you can hold on to me. If it's a flock, don't let your flock become something that you hold on to. Remember, every yearling, every foal, every baby born to that flock is mine first. The first one is mine. Why? To remind you that I own all of them. I gave them to you. You're not smart enough, strong enough to do what has been done. You couldn't free yourselves from Egypt. Could you swim across the Red Sea? Could you kill a whole army so that not even one survived of the most powerful chariot army in the world? Not even one survived? And it all comes back to one thought. How do you keep the radiance of God. I have a thing or two to say. Not, I'm not going to start with like Moses. I'm going to, here's the rules. <laughs> and if you cook this goat in its mother's milk, you're going to be in trouble. You know, no, come on. It, we're past that. All right? Every morning when you wake up, Remember who you are. Remember who you are. God expects us, me, you, his family, his kingdom, to honor him, to praise him, to lift him up for adoration. But it starts with remembering who we are. So that we can also remember who he is. If he is our pearl of great price, our father who art in heaven, we say the word so casually. We recite them over and over again. Have you ever felt the need to fall on your face on the floor in front of your bed and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, you're incredible. And you love me? It should remind us of who we are. We are his greatest reward for creating the world. The rest of the world doesn't mean a great deal. God created us to be in fellowship with himself. In the Garden of Eden, it was Adam and Eve walking with their, their creator in the evening that was the greatest joy of the creator. Almighty God 
put breath into us for fellowship. If we don't remember that we came from Him and He is our creator, sustainer, the one who gives us life, If we don't remember how much he gave of himself to save us. If we don't remember the sacrifice that broke his heart. You say, Pastor Bob, how do you know God's heart was broken? I mean, how do you know that? How do you know that? Come on. You're, 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 you're stretching things. No. In a Jewish funeral, even today, they will give you a piece of cloth they pin to your jacket or your coat or your dress. Specifically because when your heart is broken in grief and in that funeral remembrance service you just say, I can't take it anymore. My heart is breaking. I can't stand it one more minute. It's put on your clothing so that you can take that piece of cloth and just rip it right in two. And the sound of that shredding cloth. You can read in scripture so many different places where different people and different individuals took their robes and tore them at the throat. Ripped their robes open. As a sign of their grief. Their incredible sadness. Mourning. And it's told that God tore the veil of the temple from the top to the bottom at the moment that Jesus said it is completed Father into my into your hands I commend my spirit and the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom in one stretch in one pull as a symbol that almighty God who had been staying in that holy of holies behind the veil had felt his heart being broken. Now, we got to remember. But once we remember, and once we adore, and once we lift him up and say, thank you, thank you for caring about someone like me, for someone as small as I, as, as, as insignificant as I, as, as someone who can't do anything without you, then let it impact on everything we do and say throughout the day. Moses was up on that mountain 40 days and 40 nights. <coughs> the same number of days and nights that Jesus was in the wilderness without food and water as well. Just coincidence. Probably. Didn't mean anything. I think so. I don't think so. I think it was the way God connected one part of the salvation story to the other. It took God a long time to tell Moses about the tabernacle, about the temple furnishings, and the candlesticks and the showbread, how it was to be built, the engineering specifications, the blueprints for how everything was going to be put together, showed him the details of what being one of God's people meant from day-to-day -day life. It took him a long time to put all that together. It's nothing that they'd ever seen before. This was not just Egypt 2.0. I mean, this is, this is a whole new nation with a whole new series of things they were going to do every day, a whole series of things they were going to say every day, a whole series of things that was going to be a part of their culture. It's going to change the culture of the entire nation of Israel. They're a bunch of ragtag slaves. They got a whole bunch of people from Egypt who came out with them. I mean... Let's be honest, this wasn't all Hebrews that were in that group. And they were all trying to find their way to this promised land. 
And in the process, they were building a whole new culture. Every single thing about their lives was going to be, have to be instructed and created from scratch. What that tells me is we ought to be constantly asking, God, what do you want to build into our lives that more clearly shows our allegiance to you? What do we need to do to show you we are obedient people in following you? Does it mean that we dress differently? It did for the Jews. Does it mean that we fix our hair differently? Sometimes it did for the Jews. There's no other culture in the world that has those little ringlets down the side of their forehead. Does it mean you eat different food? It might. It did for the Jews. Did it mean that you might celebrate things differently than the rest of the society around you? It could. It certainly meant that for the Jews. Did it meant that you handle your finances differently? It's worked pretty good for the Jews. Did it mean we treat each other differently? It just seems like the rules on how to treat each other run after chapter, after chapter, after chapter. And, and thou shalt not do this, and thou shalt do that, and thou shalt do this, and not do that. It goes on forever. It'll, it's just the driest stuff. When I hear people say, I'm going to read through the Bible, I say, good luck, buddy. Because <laughs> a lot of that stuff gets pretty dry. Not that I'm putting down on anything, but it doesn't have meaning for today unless we realize God's speaking through his word to change us from people who just do their own thing because that's the way I was brought up. That was the way I grew up in Egypt, so to speak. But does it mean something that is important. A simple little rule. They take a piece of scripture and they write it on a little piece of paper and they stick it in a cylinder by the corner of the doorpost of the door. And just like Ryan stood up here this evening and recited from Samuel, Every time you go in and out the door, you touch that little scroll that's wrapped up in that little cylinder and repeat the scripture to put the word of God into your head. Now, you stop and think about that and say, well, I'm too busy. I mean, every time, oh, dude, oh, every time I go through the door, oh, okay, oh. Uh, I have found that I'll probably have that little scroll put at the top of the stairway because the bathroom is downstairs now. And I make that run up and down the stairway a lot. A lot more than I ever thought I would. All right? If I had that little scroll that I'm supposed to remember stuck there at the top of the stairway just to remind me, I am God's man. I'm on his mission he has commissioned me to be his person, and I am to put his commands and his instructions in my head. I would know that verse at the end of the first day. <laughs> you understand? Judy is in the process, the ladies group are, are memorizing scriptures, and they astonish me at how much they've been able to put into their heads. Memorizing whole books. It's cool. Does being God's person impact on you every single minute of the day? That's the question.
does everything you do flow out of who you are in your relationship with Him? You start by remembering. You start by just recognizing this is a new day. It's a 24-hour window in my life. That I can more deeply appreciate what God's doing in my life and in my community. The radiance is going to come and go. We have mountaintop experiences. We have wonderful rallies. We're going to have a men's retreat here in a little while. I'm going to come back with a veil over my face, okay? Because I'm going to be all excited about what God's doing in the lives of the men around the community. But how do you keep that alive? It comes from making our lives obedient and radiant and connected to God's presence and His power, a part of everyday life. It is not for me to write down a list and say, here's what you're going to do every hour of the day. It wouldn't work because all of us are different. In the New Testament, we surrender our lives in Romans as living sacrifices every day. And then we do what God has commissioned us to do. He's laid certain things into our hands to accomplish. But we need to be remembering that everything we do and say is of the Lord. It's us. And then you can have that radiance on the inside. It will stay joyful. I am doing what God asked me to do. I am faithfully fulfilling what God has given me to accomplish. I am doing my work to honor Him with my life. And the radiance boils up inside. All right? Now, that Colonel Great Price from this morning is Jesus Christ. I'm not going to take that away. But that's why Moses was given these 40 days of instructions. Because it was going to impact on everything. The way they took care of business the way they took care of their legal disputes, the way they did their territory, the way they managed their land, the way they took care of their livestock. Every part of it was based on being faithful to what God had laid out for them to be His people. It's no less for us. It's no less important for us. Okay? As those disciples were waiting in that upper room, they had no idea. But you know what their prayer had to be? Lord, I'm ready, willing, and waiting for you to tell me what to do. Just show me what it is. Just show me what it is. And then the most incredible thing, he did show them what to do. <laughs> wow! You mean, stand up and preach? Okay, you're not going to speak to a group of people. All right, that's fine. But he's given each of us something. And, and he's given us the tools to do it well. He's given us something to lift his name up for honor and glory. And we're to do it with all the passion and desire and hunger in our hearts. Okay? It's the pearl of great pie. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Who hunger and thirst like they've been 40 days in the desert without food or water. <laughs> That's pretty eager. <laughs> Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. That's the pearl of great pine. To keep the radiance of God. We get caught up in the day to day. Get caught up in what it takes to make it through the day. And, and all the little aggravations that come. And the radiance of God begins to fade. We have to go back and say, I'm yours, Lord. I am 100% totally dedicated to being your person. To being your ambassador in my little circle. Okay?